so uh, just remembering to press record. Uh, so yeah, so just, just as we take our seat here and now in connection with Mother Earth, in connection with the indigenous peoples, in connection with our spiritual ancestors who have, who have brought these teachings to us um, down through many generations, uh, that we that we honor the interconnection, that we acknowledge the we, the, the me to we uh, dimension of our lives. And I'm going to take a moment here because I forgot in the setting up to unpack my little meditation kit. <laughs> with bell and clock and so on. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to uh, share the screen um, and let's chant together as we usually do to begin our, our practice, chanting the homage, refuges and precepts, uh, turning our attention to Buddha, to Buddha. Buddha as a historical being who, who, who reached a, a awakening, who realized awakening, um, who kind of opened up the path for us in this, in our era. And, and also Buddha as it is alive within ourselves, within all beings, this, this quality of openness, awareness, uh, this capacity to, to be with life as it is, with love, with compassion and wisdom. This is, we honor this. And, uh, and as I often say, um, this is not, it's something that we do at a particular time in a, in a formal way, but also honoring the Buddha is something that we can do at any moment, that we can remember, yes, Buddha, <laughs> awake, wake up, uh, and, uh, and turn toward that essential dimension of who we are. <clears throat> So please uh, feel free to join in whatever way you like, um, uh, chanting with me uh, for those who are present here. And, and uh, if you want to chant along at home uh, with the mute on, uh, please do, or just listen or read the English and contemplate uh, what this means to you. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udang saranam gachami. Damang saranam gachami. 
Sanam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Dhamam Saranam Gachami Duty Ampi Sangam Saranam Gachami. Tati Ampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Tati Ampi Dhamam Saranam Gachami. Tati Ampi Sangam Saranam Gachami. And so taking the five precepts, the training in peaceful conduct is also such an important way that we remind ourselves to uh, to come home to who we truly are when we are um, in a state of reactivity where we may be uh, speaking with anger or, or driven by grasping, wanting something, thinking, I need this, I, you know, I have to have this, this is what's gonna make me feel good. Um, or uh, when we're lost in confusion, all the ways that, that the mind uh, gets, all the ways that we disconnect from um, our inner uh, true nature, uh, our original nature. So, so where this training in peaceful conduct and five precepts is, such an important foundation and 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 it's a part of our path all the way it's it's not just a uh, something that we do in the beginnings it's something that we're doing even at the very uh you know as we move, walk along the path we, we continue to to practice these presets in in deeper and deeper ways our understanding of them develops So again, uh, please join me in chanting these um, or just take them in, let them, you know, kind of seep into your consciousness as, as, um, as we chant them. Panati pata veramani sikapadam samadhyami Adina dana where amani sikapadam samadhyami. Kame sumi chachara where amani sikapadam samadhyami. Musawada where amani sikapadam samadhyami. Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana where amani sikapadam samadhyami. Idami sila maga fala nyanasa pachayo ho tu. Sadhu, 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 anumodami.
to um, bring bring out the book that um, I've been I've, I've shared this uh, with everybody, you know, for over the months. But just a reminder that uh, that the reference that I'm using in teaching the, the Satipatthana is Bhikkhu and Alio's uh, Satipatthana Meditation and Practice Guide. Um, so we have been talking about the five hindrances, so sense, desire, anger, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and um, doubt. And, and so, uh, so I'm going to just um, spend one more week uh, today uh, kind of finishing up talking about the, the hindrances uh, in talking about the absence, what we experience and what to bring our attention to what, what, is, what is the mind, the nature of the mind when we are experiencing the absence of the hindrances because you know that happens <laughs> it's the mind and more and more it happens more and more as we as we continue uh meditating and our practice becomes regular and become grounded we find that the mind becomes more open less reactive uh, clear uh we're not we're not judging ourselves. We're not judging our experience. We're not getting caught in, in you know, wanting, wanting, grasping like this desi sense, desire, fantasies. Like you know, I need to have that. I want that. Um, or, um, or you know, narratives around anger where we get into these dramas. You know, like. They, they shouldn't have said that, that was wrong. I'm gonna tell them off, I'm gonna do this, do that. They'll be sorry, you know? Like we get into these narratives that they can, we can get lost in them. Um, and, uh, and, and on the cushion, you know, of course it, it arises on the cushion as well. Um, and, and in our daily life, uh, but, you know, especially when we're, well, I, I use the expression on the cushion to mean meditation. So we could be sitting, standing, lying down or walking. It's, it's not, but, but that dedicated practice where we are, you know, where it's a discipline, we're bringing our attention back again and again, really so supports how we, how mindfulness evolves in our daily life. And, and so we see these things arising. We see, we have the opportunity to see how the mind gets caught up. Sleepiness, confusion, zoning out, worrying, the mind just, just uh, jumping around from thing to thing, um, thought to thought. Uh, or doubt, you know, we talked last week, self-doubt, uh, especially can be doubting the practice, can be very um, unsettling, keeps us from settling, you know, so if we say that, that the mind is settled, the mind is, is collected, and these hindrances are unsettling, I think that's a, a good way to think about it. Um, and, and there, there's, um, there's a metaphor that's used in, uh, talking about the hindrances and, um, and, uh, Biku Analyo has, uh, illustrated his books. He's actually quite, quite a, a skilled illustrator. And, um, and so these are five bowls, uh, of water. Mm -hmm. So five bowls of water, but but um, but th with the hindrances, you know, when when the when there's no hindrance present, 
uh, the bowl, the clear water can reflect back our face. We can look into a bowl of water and we can see ourselves. And that's the, that's the metaphor for when the mind is free of these uh, disturbances, these patterns that draw us away from being present and attentive and at home in ourselves, you know, that like when, when we're attentive, when we're mindful and not, and not being caught up, we can see our true face. And we can also see the true face of others. It's always in the Satipatthana. It's the practices internally and externally. So, so how do these hindrances interfere in the, with our seeing the true face of, a, of, of ourselves and others? And so, so the first one, uh, sense desire, it's, um, It's a uh, water that is has dye mixed in, so it's colored. It's colored with some some fantasy of, of some particular sense desire, whether it's you know, food or sex or having an object or having an experience or um, so so we're just colored and everything that we we do and we see when we're caught up in that, it's, it's, it's like we're seeing through some kind of haze of, and we can't see clearly. And so, you know, if, if you've ever worked with sense desire uh, and, and, and recognize, you know, okay, you know, this is, there's a kind of a, I, for myself, I experience it as a kind of reaching outward and the mind gets kind of caught up of wanting something and then, and then recognizing it. So that's, you know, that's so beautiful. Oh, okay. You know, this is, this is, you know, it, say if it's food, you know, it's like getting caught up in, you know, eating more than I need to eat, wanting to keep eating. And I'm like, oh, that's no, I, you know, my body is satisfied. I, I, that's desire. And just feeling that, like the pattern of that, how does that feel in the body? And, and saying, okay, I can just be with that, attend to it, know what, know it for what it is see how, and of course, in, the, in this fourth Satipatthana, we're seeing the conditionality of the arising of desire and uh, the conditionality of the, the passing away of sense desire. And part of the conditionality of passing, the passing away is, is recognizing it, right? So, so recognizing it, perhaps just letting it be, or maybe just saying, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk away from this, you know, place, maybe in the kitchen or wherever it is that I'm getting caught up in, in sense desire and, or, you know, just walk away. And, and then, and then the Buddha says, notice what the mind feels like when you're, when sense desire has moved through and has passed away. What's the quality of mind? So important that we begin to recognize not only the presence of the hindrance, but also the absence of the hindrance. And because that, 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 that quality of attention is, there's a joy in it. There is a pleasure in it it of be of having the mind be clear settled not being pulled and so um so seeing the absence means that that the dye somehow coloring has been re removed neutralized settled so the uh, the second of the 
uh, images is um, for anger is the is the water is boiling, you know. So so I think that's a good one because you know for me often when I feel anger there's a kind of a heat that I feel and yeah so you you know you look at you know a pot or a bowl of water that's boiling and you know it's hard even to look into it because it's the heat that's coming off of it uh, so you definitely can't see your your image you can't see a, a clear image and when we you know when we are angry at ourselves you know like that it's painful you know like turning anger toward ourselves turning anger toward another and holding that, holding that narrative. Like uh, sometimes just we can be angry at a situation and then we transfer it onto the world around us. Like <clears throat> everything's wrong, everything's wrong. And, uh, and so it's not to say that sometimes anger doesn't arise. <clears throat> You know, like anger is a natural thing that arises sometimes when we see harm being done. So, so, so I think that's a corrective that's being voiced a lot in talking about the teachings on anger uh, is that we shouldn't feel guilty. But when anger arises, it's just a signal that we're recognizing harm to ourselves or to others. And to not live in that anger, not dwell in anger, because then, uh, you know, I think the, the expression burn out is a really good one having to do with anger. I have a question, but I can wait at the end. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, so, so yeah, so then anger, noticing how we experience it, noticing, like anger is said to be the most painful of hindrances. Um, so noticing how painful it is. And, uh, and then how, can, how, how do we work with that? I mean, sometimes just recognizing, oh, there, there's anger or aversion or judgment or irritation, all the different forms of anger. And just feeling how it lives in the body and uh, giving space for it, you know. Again, I just I just want to point out I'm I'm talking so much about how the body is our ally in this practice, and 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 how the energy can be known in the body, and uh, and recognized and and given space to be known in the body. And it's it's challenging to know the pain of anger in the body. And sometimes there are different ways of working with anger, and we, we talked about that um, in our, uh, you know, in the times when we, in the week that we uh, dealt with anger. Um, sometimes sharing it uh, with a trusted friend. Uh, so, so like it being held, getting some help to hold it. Can, can be a skillful way to work with anger. So not somebody who's gonna stir up your anger, <laughs> but somebody who's gonna help you hold it uh, skillfully and wisely. Um, and, uh, you know, writing or, or just working through the anger by walking, being physical, all of these can be skillful ways of working with anger. But noticing how we feel when it is absent. Um, and how, you know, very often I've seen for myself when anger is present and is, you know, I'm, I'm just caught up in it. And, and, and then when I somehow work with it, let it go, it, it does shift the way I can see, 
you know, using that metaphor, seeing clearly, whether it's seeing the other, seeing myself, seeing, seeing uh, my life, you know, it does, um, it does shift. So the, the, um, So the, the image for uh, sloth and torpor is uh, that it's overgrown, that the water gets overgrown with algae. It's uh, stagnation, like, like it's stagnant. The water is stagnant, so it's not moving, it's stuck. And so, uh, so of course, you know, if, you, if we're looking in a bowl where there's, you know, it's overgrown with algae, we're, we're definitely not seeing um, any clearly at all. We're, we're just we're just kind of in that in that you know overgrowth of uh, and the rampant growth of, of algae. And uh, and so again, you know, sloth and torpor can be something that's hard to deal with and people work with sloth and torpor in their formal sitting practice and work with confusion, work with spaciness, feeling spaced out. You know, all of these are ways of uh, the mind kind of being, losing its clarity and, and being stagnant. And, and so noticing when that that sloth and torpor is absent. And when the mind feels, when there's energy, the mind is present and engaged, not restless, so not going to that point of restlessness, but, um, but, but attentive, aware, present, alive. So, so noticing how it feels and and really taking joy in that, that nourishes our practice. And so, um, uh, so the, the next image uh, is, is uh, restlessness and worry is, is that the wind is blowing and the, and, the, and the surface of the water is all, you know, unsettled. It's all full of waves and ripples. And, and then, you know, that again, we can't see clearly, we can't see ourselves, we can't see the, our face, and, and we can't see others clearly as well. So we're just too caught up to, uh, you know, for me, restlessness and worry often just um, is, is manifested as doing, doing, doing. You know, or if it's worry, it could be about a particular thing that I'm just, you know, I'm so caught up in how I think something should play out. Something should be happening, you know, that it's my expectation, it's my story that I want to see, you know, happen, uh, unfold in certain circumstances. It might be about me, it might be about somebody else that I feel close to or some situation. And, uh, and so, so the mind is just not still. It's, it's, it's caught up in, this, in some kind of uh, to-do list or, um, or expectation or uh, so, so this restlessness and worry, uh, restlessness often felt as agitation in the body, um, worry often felt as a mental, you know, like scenarios playing out. So the water, again, is unclear. And then doubt is the, um, the, the muddy water. So, the, you know, when the, when the, when the uh, mud is stirred up at the bottom of a pond, uh, so doubt is this, you know, unsettled, um, not, not, not feeling uh, grounded, but the, 
that the ground that's beneath the water is always being stirred up uh, with um, feeling uncertain uh, that I don't, I don't trust myself, I don't trust the teachings. And so, so again, uh, this, this image. And, and so, so this gift of, of the water being settled, being clear, being um, at peace, uh, that we can attend to ourselves. And, and, and it was something that we really touched on last week, talking about self-doubt. And then, and then the beauty, uh, the joy, the, the peace and the contentment of, of being able to come home to ourselves and recognize that we are already free, that we are already, we are already we have this, we are this quality of openness and awareness. Uh, it's, it's present to us and with us, it's, it's in us, it's who we are essentially. And that all of these afflictive states of mind that, that interfere with our resting in that deep knowing are adventitious, that's a word that I learned when Joseph Goldstein talked about <laughs> those adventitious means that they just arise. They arise. They pass away. They're not. They're not our essential nature. They're they're uh, transient. They're states that arise from the causes and conditions of our our life, our history, uh, the present circumstances. And I, I attended a, um, an online uh, practice uh, in the Bun Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist tradition uh, on Friday uh, on, on embracing death. And, um, and, and one of the questions that she asked as we, we went through the practice, uh, which was, you know, going through the different chakras and 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 touching into the different emotional states that arose as we did different contemplations, is to ask ourselves, you know, who is that? Um, who is that one? Who is grasping? or who is pushing away in anger, or who is zoning out or turning away in confusion and sloth and torpor? Who is that one who is so restless and agitated? Who is that one who is uh, so caught up in doubt? And, and searching for you know, that one that we think that we are in that moment. You know, we think that we are the one who wants that. We think that we are the one who is so angry. We think that we are the one who's confused and so on. But when we look and we ask, who is, who is that one? You know, looking inward and trying to find that one, that being. There's no one to be found. There's no self that can be discovered. And what we can discover is simply the knowing of the awareness of whatever it is that's arising. We can, we can see through that 
arising mental state and, and see through to the simple awareness of it. That awareness that is always there, that is always available to us, that is always present, that is our true home, that we can stabilize a presence in that awareness. And, and when, we, when we come to know that mind that is free of hindrances, that is mindful and energized and awake, and, 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 and we're gonna later, we're gonna go through the awakening factors, you know, which uh, is, you know, is a very beautiful exploration. You know, all the qualities of a mind that is awake um, there's, uh, there's a, a joy that's known that we can abide in, in, in the awakening. So, and again, it's not that we wake up and we discover that, that quality of presence and then we've made it, okay, good to go, you know, here I am, I'm Buddha. You know, it's, it's something that, it's something that we, Practice is about experiencing that, recognizing the beauty, the joy, the, the quality of that that benefits both ourselves and the world. And, and, and learning to live from that, you know, we can take that with us when we, when we get up and we go and live our lives. And then we forget, and then we need to begin again. And, uh, you know, and, and the precepts help to hold us, you know, in, in that uh, quality of attention that doesn't, you know, harm ourselves. So, um, so I'll just pause for a moment and see if, um, so I'll just repeat the question for the recording. So the, the question has to do with um, uh, somatic uh, trauma, um, you know, working with uh, trauma on, a, on this level of the body and healing and so on. And, um, and so somatic, healing in of trauma can be really important in um, in, a, in our Buddhist practice uh, just as so can psychotherapy but they're not the same thing so so it's important to recognize that you know working with hindrances is um, is a way of discovering patterns in the mind. And there's definitely an overlap. You know, there's definitely an overlap, um, but it's not the same thing. Because emotions are in the body. Absolutely. You know, they're all in the body. And anger, anger is a very healthy, actually, emotions. It's an emotion that put boundaries. Often we're very angry because we haven't put our boundaries. And it's the greatest thing we can have is to feel that anger because it's a message to us. Okay, I don't want to get okay. into a, a, because, a big discussion yeah. now, maybe after the yeah. sitting, yeah. because I like to uh, allow totally. people to take the teaching into the sitting yes. and, and, and work with it. Yeah, um, Yeah. so, so I, I did touch on that. And, you know, it's definitely true that anger is not something that is bad. It's, it's a messenger that tells us when we're being harmed. And, um, and so, but when it becomes harmful is when we're, uh, when we think that the anger itself is protecting us. You know, we, we can get lost in anger and we think I have to stay angry or I have to stay vigilant uh, all the time, hypervigilant. Um, because I'm going to get hurt. 
and and that somehow anger is protecting me, but anger is actually uh, separating us from our our heart, and so we need to learn that though, not to not to judge the anger, but to learn to recognize that it's pointing to where we need to develop ways to feel safe and uh, and free. Um, so, and I'm not I'm not a somatic therapist. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm not I I don't I don't want to yeah. uh, try to no, engage that too much. That's very interesting yeah. because there are so many you know H emotions. Like I've seen work with people that needed it to be angry so much to heal that was the power they had repressed all their lives and that anger which I don't connect with the pain I, I see a real difference between anger and pain and then these people heal themselves with having their whole being angry totally in their whole body that's what they needed well okay. there's yeah. okay yeah. so let's let's yeah. let's yeah let's not go way yeah. into that uh so, but there's more than one way. There's not only one way. You know, the path has many, like there are many, uh, many roads up the mountain, uh, but one moon grazes the peak. That's the Zen saying. Many paths up the mountain, one moon grazes the peak. So it's not to say this is the only way, this is the right way. There's skillful means. Sometimes people need to really be in the anger and, and hopefully they would be doing that guided by somebody who can help them through it yeah. because it's, um, yeah, it's, it's something that is, it really requires some skill to work with. So let's, um, let's bring our attention to the body, uh, to to ground ourselves in the body. Feeling the whole body being supported by Mother Earth. Um, and I forgot to say, uh, please do take a moment or a minute, whole minute if you wanna stand up, if you wanna stretch, if you need to move around before you get into uh, meditation posture, please do that, um, and I'll uh, I'll wait to begin the guiding. So as we take our posture, whatever it is, sitting, standing, lying down, walking, or meditation, let's begin to feel the body in connection with the earth. being held by the earth, supported, body in connection with space, the space around us, the openness,
our, our being in connection with life around us, <clears throat> with people, people in the room, people in whatever space you're in, with the, the sky, plants, the trees, the sun. That intraconnectedness, interbeing. The we, the not separate <clears throat> self. If it's helpful for you to feel the breath and turn the attention to the breath. Feeling the rhythm of the breath. Noticing how is this breath expressing itself right now? Does it feel tight? Does it feel relaxed? Does it feel short or long? Fast or slow? And just bringing the attention to the breath might actually invite the breath to become more calm and relaxed. Sometimes people experience that, sometimes they don't. So it's not that you should experience a certain thing. Gradually opening up the attention to feeling the whole body sitting. Perhaps the breath just moves into the background. It's there when you bring attention to it. Knowing the body and the mind to be together, body and mind connected. Breath and awareness, body and awareness connected. Perhaps just for a moment, maybe the mind then goes off to past or future. And then we notice. Perhaps we notice it's wanting or some kind of aversion, anger or irritation. or confusion. Or a mind that's dull. And just bringing the attention to this quality. or this characteristic that is present in the mind. 
bringing the attention with mindfulness without judging as much as we can. Sometimes we know we shouldn't be judging or we know we shouldn't be liking or disliking or preferring and yet we find it's there. And then we can be aware of that. Or we can just bring love. Bring love, bring compassion, care to the whole tangled up mind. It is caught up and then judging the caught upness and wanting to be free of the caught upness. And we see, oh, there's a big tangle. And let me just be aware of that tangle with kindness, with compassion. Maybe we don't even know how to name it. And coming back as a home base to feeling the whole body. and bringing awareness to each moment that we feel we are present. It doesn't have to be 100% clear, perfect, still mind. silent mind, but where the background noise has subsided to the degree that we can be present in the body, not be caught up in past or future or in fantasy, present to this breath. And perhaps turning the attention inward, 
present to this one who knows. This one who is, who is the knowing. Not a separate thing. This quality of knowing which we share with every other being.
As we come to the end of our practice together, let's once again bring to mind that we enter our, that who we are is intimately and intricately and un, inseparably connected to the life around us. And so that as we liberate ourselves, this bit spills out into the world around us. And we can bring an intention it really deepens and strengthens our practice as we bring an intention to offer this, this benefit that we, we, we that this intention is at the center of our practice, that we practice to free ourselves and also to benefit the world around us. So perhaps taking a moment in silence to bring to mind those people, those places, those situations that you're holding in your heart. Perhaps they're struggling, perhaps they're suffering, perhaps they're emerging in beauty and thriving. and sharing the blessing, the goodness of our practice. May our practice and our lives serve and support the happiness, well-being and liberation of all beings. Thank you.